We're so pleased that you've come to be with us on the second day of our lectureship. Got off to a wonderful start yesterday and looking forward to some more good preaching on what says the scripture. It was the year after the pandemic, 2021, when we had to wait to see if we were going to be able to have the lectures, having canceled them the year before. And because we were right on the edge of having guys prepare material, we went ahead and said, here's the theme. You submit some subjects that you can preach on that theme. And the lectures went so well, the elders have decided to continue that same format. And so this year, we gave the speakers the theme, and they all submitted subjects that they'd like to speak on. And once the program was announced and sent out to the speakers for their final approval, Russ sent an email and said, well, clearly, I didn't get it. Because he said, mine's the only one that doesn't start with the word about. What does the scripture say about? And you know, Russ is very fragile. (laughs) And so I told him, well, the theme is what says the scripture. And I said, so you've quoted scripture in each of yours. You're the only one who did get it. And he bought it. But he's going to speak to us today from Leviticus 18 and 19. What says the scripture? God told the Israelites, I am the Lord. That's why you do what you do, because I'm the Lord. We look forward to that this morning. Brother Stevens is going to lead us in a song. And we have so enjoyed having Anthony and Robin Jenton with us. Anthony is one of the preachers we support. Going back to his time in Hawaii, now they're in Justin, Texas, and Anthony does a lot of preaching in the Spanish churches. And just to remind you of perhaps what we take for granted here, they said they've loved being here just to get to sing in English. And they've uh, got to go back this afternoon. And so uh, Anthony is going to lead our prayer after the song. And then we'll hear from Russ Bowman, I am the Lord. Thank you for being here. Heavenly Father. 
Father, we are thankful for this day, thankful for the night's rest, thankful for the opportunity to be here in this place for a study of your word. Thankful for the privilege that we have to be able to open our voices and sing, to open up our minds to look at your word, to see the things eternal that you have prepared for us and said in the scripture. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the church which meets in this place. We're thankful for the elders and their oversight as they shepherd this flock. We're thankful for the work that this church does here in this community and throughout the world as they help others to preach the word. Father, we pray, we pray that you bless Brother Bubba and his work here. Our Father, this morning we pray that you bless our brothers as they present the word. Help us to open up our minds as we open up your word to see the lessons that we need to learn and to apply to our lives. Father, we're thankful for Brother Stevens and his work and leading us in the singing. It is so nice to be able to sing praises to you and to your high and holy name. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you bless the sick, those that need your help. Father, we pray that you bless those who are spiritually sick, that they will open their eyes to see the wonderful salvation that you have for them and for us. Father, we're thankful for all things, thankful for the physical things of this life, our food, clothing, and shelter, but especially those blessings which you have provided through your written revelation and the great sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Father, we're thankful to be your adopted children and you, Father, as our Heavenly Father. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Open your Bibles, if you would, and put your bookmark in Leviticus chapter 18. And then once you finish with that, if you'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 8, that's where we're going to start this morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I know it's a short night. Uh, for those of you who are here last night, I uh, appreciate so much your interest in spiritual things. Um, grateful for your kindness and for your encouragement. Uh, uh, my comments introductory were very limited last night uh, and will be again, but it is an honor to speak with these guys, to, to work with these men, uh, and, and I appreciate the work that they do and have done, uh, the reputations they have. Always good to be uh, with Tim, and uh, I do appreciate appreciate Bubba's concern for my emotional stability. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it is so out of character for Bubba to say something nice. Uh, and uh, man, uh, how can you not be encouraged and ready to go when Bubba's concerned about making sure that your fragile uh, mindset is not uh, overwhelmed by the subjects of the, of the Southside lectures. So uh, Hebrews chapter 8, if you would. There's a well-known passage of Scripture where uh, the, the Hebrew writer addresses the covenant that we have with God, this new covenant that we have with God. And without going through all of the context, I, I offer for your attention Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 8, where he says, Finding fault with them, that is, uh, with the old covenant, uh, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more it's a kind of an interesting observation because essentially what the Hebrew writer tells us in, in these few verses is one of the big differences that's going to exist between the old covenant and the new covenant uh, is your relationship with me. You, you, this covenant is going to be born out of trust, which is what we started talking about last night, that, that you're going to enter into an agreement with me and I'm going to provide for you and you are going to conform yourself to me and you're going to do so because you trust to me and what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to forgive you. I, I'm, I'm going to take care of your iniquities. I'm not going to remember anymore the things that have divided us. This raises a lot of questions, I, I think, in people's mind. It, it does if you're a serious Bible student. How do I know that God's going to forgive me? Uh, as I've gotten older and, and as you t teach people and talk to people about forgiveness, it seems to me that that's one of the practical realities that you have to grapple with. We are telling people God makes you innocent. You're not guilty anymore before God. And my question, as skeptical as I tend to be, is well, how am I supposed to know that that's true? I, I, can't, I can't test it by the empirical method. Well, we know because of faith, because of our trust in God, because what God has revealed to us in his word, remember faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, what God has revealed to us in his word is ample reason to believe the things that we can't test. And that's the way that faith works. And so our covenant, unlike the Israelites, doesn't come because we were born into a nation and then had to come to learn about God. That's what the Israelites did. They, they, they had a covenant with God because of who their parents were. They didn't know who God was until they were taught. But our covenant with God is based upon our knowledge of God. And so, therefore, you're not going to have to teach one another, know the Lord. Everyone in a covenant with me will know me because you have learned to trust me. And so what we're trying to do, at least in my section, my misunderstood and, and uh, misguided section of these lectures, is to try to talk about faith and what the Bible tells us about God and how it is that we can come to an understanding of him so that we can have this covenant that he has promised us. And so as you turn back to the Old Testament at this point, and if you've got your bookmark in Leviticus, flip all the way back to the beginning of Exodus, and I want you to appreciate that what God does in this section, and, and several have made comments in this regard, and, and, and they are true, this is more than just a story. This is, a, this is history with a purpose. And the purpose is not just to help us understand how the children of Israel came to be the children of Israel. The purpose is to help us to understand who God is and what God is doing and what God ultimately is going to do in the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham. And so this is history with a purpose. And it is an introduction to the God who asks us to trust him. More specifically, it is an introduction to Yahweh who is God. The Exodus story uh, b begins with uh, the children of Israel in Egypt. And here's what I want to do with this lesson this morning. We're, we're going to take a, hopefully a fairly short period of time, and, and, and I want to run through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to summarize the history. And then we're going to come back and, and try to put this little section that I asked you to read in a context so that we can get what's going on here. And then I want to make a couple of practical applications. So how is it that, that the children of Israel even come to, to be where they are and to have any kind of connection with God? Well, Joseph goes down into Egypt. He saves his people. You're familiar with the end of Genesis. And as Exodus begins, we find the children of Israel 400 years later living in Egyptian captivity. Stop right there. 400 years. You see what culture is doing to God's people in our day? Do you see that? Yes? Shake your head. Yes. Do, can you imagine what would happen if you gave 400 years of a culture that, that, that embraces other gods, that embraces other systems of morality, other belief systems? Can you imagine what that would do to us? We are much concerned about that in our day and age. It is no wonder that the children of Israel, as Exodus begins, have very little appreciation or knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 400 years and yet what happens is that as Moses runs off into the wilderness and spends 40 years there and comes to understand and know about God, who he has some understanding of, God sends him back. And as he sends him back, he sends him back with a message. And the message is, I, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to deliver my people. In chapter 3 at the burning bush, he tells Moses in verse 6, 
I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses hid his face and was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I've seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. We understand all of that. But part of what God also tells Moses is... I, I want these people to know who I am. Later in that chapter, Moses says to God in verse 13, When I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they say to me, What is his name? What do I say to them? How, how am I supposed to get them to believe that you're going to bring them out of captivity? They don't even know who you are. Interestingly enough, if you go over a couple of chapters, his first interview with Pharaoh when he gets back to Egypt and says, let my people go, what does Pharaoh say? Who, who, is, who is Yahweh that I should let your people go? I don't know who this is. Some unnamed God from the wilderness that all of a sudden you want me to listen to? I don't know him. And thus we get to chapter 6, as we mentioned last night, God spoke to Moses and said, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name is Yahweh. I was not known to them. I've established my covenant to give them the land of Canaan. Verse 5, I've heard their groaning. Verse 6, tell them, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Verse 7, I'll take you as my people. I'll be your God. You will know that I am Yahweh, your God. And so God begins to introduce himself. And so what he does is he uh, shows his power. The plagues upon Egypt, they are intended not simply to break the will of Pharaoh, they are intended to help the children of Israel see who God is and what God can do. They're used to the gods of Egypt, the gods of the Nile, the sun god, the various and sundry fertility gods that the Egyptians, but they didn't know the real god yet. In chapter 10, as, as these plagues continue, God tells Moses in verse 1, Go into Pharaoh, I've hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt and the signs that I've done among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. You see it again at the end of the crossing of the Red Sea. When you get over to chapter 14 and the, first, the, the last couple of verses, when the children of Israel see the dead Egyptians that God has destroyed, drowning their entire army. The, Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore and they saw the great work that the Lord had done in Egypt and the people feared the Lord and believed Yahweh and his servant Moses. What is it that God does? Well... He shows his control over nature. He shows his control over death. He shows his control over the gods of, of, of Egypt. He, he shows that he can make it so dark that you can't even light a lamp in one house, but you go to the next house and, and they have light. He shows a distinction between his people and their people, and he shows them this is what Yahweh can do. And so beginning in chapter 19, they leave Egypt. And they start wandering off towards Mount Sinai. I, I would love to have known some of the conversations that went on. Did the elders get together with Moses and say, look, where are we going? You, you know, okay, we got, we're out of Egypt now. Now what? Okay, we're supposed to go to the promised land, and we know because God tells us, I didn't take them up by the coastal road because the Philistines were there, and I wasn't ready for them to see war yet. Did God tell Moses that so that he could tell the leaders that, or did they just follow this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire off into the wilderness and think, where in the world are we going? And yet that's exactly what they did. As the story proceeds and you get to chapter 19, God has brought them to Mount Sinai. By the way, last night's lesson, he has already given them water from a rock. He's already feeding them with manna. He's already introducing himself. I can provide for you. I can take care of you. Don't worry too much about where we're going. I've got this. And so he gets them to Mount Sinai, and at Mount Sinai, from Exodus 19 to Numbers chapter 10, 
They spend a year camped out at the base of this mountain. Was it you, David, that yesterday talked about, I, I don't like camping? Uh, a year. A year they're, they're, they're camped out around this mountain. I don't know if that's God's intention because what happens in that time, first of all, is God appears to them. He tells them, I brought you here to make you my people. I want you to be holy. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation to me. We're going to have a relationship. So he appears on the mountain and he speaks the Ten Commandments to them and he scares them to death on purpose so that they might always fear him. Moses would tell us later on in Deuteronomy. And so they make a covenant. God offers them, look, you've seen what I can do. Here's what my plan is for you. I'm going to send you to the promised land because that was the promise that I made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so here's what I want. I'll take care of you and I want you to obey my commands. So Moses goes up on the mountain and God starts revealing to him the law. Forty days later, what did the children of Israel do? Well, where's Moses? Do, do you notice the disconnect? It's the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. It's the manna from heaven. It's the water from the rock. It's all of these things God is doing, and yet when the visible leader is gone, they forget about God. Where's Moses? What's happened to him? I tell you what, Aaron, why don't you make a representative of our gods? And so they begin to disregard the commands that God has made. Moses comes down from the mountain because God is angry. I'm going to destroy him in a moment. I'm going to make a new nation out of you. And Moses basically argues with God, look, they're you, your people that you brought up. And, and, and God says, no, they're your people that you brought up, Moses. I'm done with them. It's an interesting exchange. And finally, God relents. Moses comes down. The, the golden calf is destroyed. And then for 40 days, this is an interesting thing that I didn't realize until just recently. Moses takes his tent and he moves it outside the camp. And he spends 40 days praying that God would still take care of his people. You see this in Exodus chapter 32 and 33, but it, you, you get the sense of it when you go over to Deuteronomy chapter 9. And, and basically Moses said, I, 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 I had to argue with God about whether he was going to kill Aaron. I had to argue with God about whether he was going to kill all of you. And I spent 40 days interceding for you. Finally, God relents tells Moses, come back up on the mountain and we'll finish what we started. And so 40 days later, Moses comes down with the law. If you didn't calculate all that, that's three 40s in a row. That's four months where the future of the children of Israel was in doubt as they're camped out around the base of the mountain eating the bread that God is giving them every day. What irony is here? And so he comes back down, and as we begin, beginning in chapter 35 of Exodus, you'll notice that, first of all, God proclaims his name. And I do want to read this little verse or two. Turn to Exodus chapter 34 and look at verses 5 through 7. When Moses comes back on the mountain, the Lord passed before him. This is 34 and verse uh, 6, actually. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. What a description of the God right then who's not destroying this people. So Moses comes down, they spend the next several months constructing the tabernacle, and that takes us through the end of Exodus and up to the first ten chapters of Leviticus. They begin the sacrifices, Nadab and Abihu don't obey God. God destroys Nadab and Abihu, and then chapters 11 through 17, you start having some practical admonitions, and that brings us to chapter 18. What have they learned? Well, they, they've learned what God can do. They've learned what God wants. They have the law at this point. But they haven't yet learned who God is. And so when you get to this section, and I'm not going to read all of it, what you have essentially in Leviticus chapter 18 and 19 is God telling the people, 
This is who I am. I want you to notice the first five verses in chapter 18. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh, your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where ye dwelt, you shall not do. According to the lands of the Canaan, of Canaan uh, where I'm bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does... He will live by them. Do you remember Deuteronomy chapter 8 that we mentioned last night? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's telling them, do what I tell you to do, and that's going to be the key to your existence. But I want you to understand, you can't be like the Egyptians were. That's not who I am. I'm not like the Egyptians. You can't be like the Canaanites are. That's not who I am. You can't be like the Canaanites. I want you to be like me. That makes perfect sense to us, does it not? We, we, we talk all the time about our identity as Christians, about our, 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 our being the people of God, about being reborn so that we once again have a relationship with our Creator who made us to be in His image and likeness. We put these things together all the time, but we miss this section where God says, I don't want you to be like everybody else. I want you to be like me. If you keep your bookmark there and flip back to chapter 11, there, there is this... A statement that God makes at the end of the giving of the clean and unclean animals. And at the end of that, God says, and this is an explanation. If you want to know why couldn't they eat pig, I would have rebelled not being able to have bacon for breakfast. I, I, that, that would have been problematic for me. Uh, but why? Why can't I not do this? Listen to God. I For, here's the because, for I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. That, that, that phrase, again, at the end of verse 45, I'm the Lord that brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You be holy, for I am holy. That helps us to understand what goes on in chapter 18. And you'll notice he repeats it at the beginning of chapter 19. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. All of the judgments of God, all of the ordinances of God, and for us and the things we've already talked about this week, all of the commands of God are what they are because they are a reflection of the holiness of God. What they all say is, I want you to be like me. I want you to think like I think. I, I want you to act like I act. I want you to see yourselves as I see myself. I want you to appreciate that you are my people and that my judgments and ordinances reflect my being and life, eternal life as we understand it, is an issue of compliance to that. And so you have chapter 18 and 19. Okay, My, my dad would say, this is a very pregnant passage of Scripture, okay? Because what you have here 21 times in these two chapters is God saying, I am Yahweh. And that's simply the way he says it. And I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to run over it with you. But I want you to notice, sometimes it's the beginning of a section, sometimes it's the end of a section, but the section is authorized by the simple statement, I am Yahweh. Look down to verse 21 in chapter 18, just as an example. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your, of your God. I am Yahweh. He doesn't say because I am Yahweh. He simply says, do this, I am God. In fact, more than that, I am Yahweh, your God. It would be like saying, I'm, I'm a man. No, I'm Bubba the man. There's a difference in a generic identity and a specific identity. You get that? And that's exactly what he's doing. He doesn't simply say, I am God. He says, I am Yahweh. This is who I am. And so those are the signposts in these two chapters. And what he addresses is, and I'm going to run through these, so stay with me. Hopefully you've already read it. Verses 6 through 20 in chapter 18, sexual purity. And here's where the pregnancy of the implications. 
he, he talks about sexual purity in a couple of ways. He talks about lying with or defiling yourself with or, or, or having inter, intercourse mating with, but he also talks about uncovering nakedness. And, and my, in my own mind, I've, I've, I kind of fluctuate. Is this uncovering nakedness, is this describing a sexual act? Or is it a much broader concept? Dave talked about modesty yesterday. I, I personally believe that this addresses the idea of the purity of the human body and the, and, and the keeping our nakedness covered. He said, well, well, that's a principle and not a particular. Yeah, it is. We better get used to that, folks, because principles are significant. We don't have to have a thou shalt and thou shalt not to understand what it is to serve our God. It helps, but the more we know God, the more we can understand what he wants. So he talks about sexual purity. In verse 21, as we've already read, he talks about idolatry. Verses 22 through 30 talks about sexual perversion, which includes homosexuality. And bestiality, if you think bestiality is not coming, I've already seen several references to news stories where people are trying to legalize sexual relationships with their pets. And you think, you have got to be kidding. Well, 30, 40 years ago, I would have said, you'd have you got to be kidding if we're trying to legalize same-sex marriage and intercourse. That's where we're going. God says, this is a perversion to me. I am the Lord. Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Be holy. I am the Lord. Uh, chapter 3, or verse 3, excuse me, in chapter 19. Revere your father and mother and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord. Verse 4 through 8, he talks about idolatry and propriety in worship, by the way, how they are to go about uh, their sacrifices. Verses 9 and 10. Harvesting the land and not reaping the corners of your field. That's about benevolence. You be benevolent people. I am Yahweh. Verses 11 and 12, honesty. Don't lie, don't steal, don't, don't uh, swear by my name falsely, don't profane my name. By the way, here's another one of those little principle things. OMG in a text is blasphemous. D did I make that clear? To use, oh my God in a casual, irreverent way is profaning the identity of our Creator. We need to see that stuff. You will not profane the name of the Lord. I am Yahweh. He goes on, verses... Uh, uh, where are we? 13 and 14. Be considerate and benevolent. Verses 15 and 16. Use justice and be good neighbors. Verses 17 and 18. Love one another. Verses 19 through 22. I, I want you to appreciate what holiness is. Verse 23 through 25. Here, here's, here's the concept that's based. Verse 26 through 29. Sorcery and witchcraft. And I, I, let, let me throw this one out too right quick. Uh, verse 28, you should not make cuttings in your flesh for the dead or tattoo marks on you, I am the Lord. I, I, every now and then somebody says, is it a sin? Is it a sin to have a tattoo? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I can't find a prohibition about that in the New Testament. And I understand this is Old Testament. It's very clear from the context. It says something about a connection to something else like cuttings for the dead or in the connection with worshiping other gods. But I will make this application. I, you want to have a tattoo, you, 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 you know, you want to wear your hair upside down and backwards. Hey, be thankful you even have it, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you want to pierce your kneecap, that, that's fine. I, but but, but, but let, me, let me make this suggestion. Think about what you're saying to everybody else. Because that in part is the reason that God prohibits this. If people see cuttings in your flesh for the dead, what you're saying is, here's my regard or reverence, or very often and probably the idea is my worship of my ancestors or those who have died. There is a perception that grows out of the way we dress and the way we act and the way we talk and the way we think, and we need to be conscious of that. I'm not making that a binding law upon you. God doesn't do that in the New Testament, but he does tell us to be conscious of our influence. And I've told my girls uh, who have some propensities for some of those things that they'd like to do, uh, I'd like for you to not do that while you're living at home. Why not, Dad? And I said, because 
People my age associate certain things with rebellion. For the same reason that when I was a young man and started preaching, I wouldn't grow a beard. Because in my day, when I was a young man, growing a beard was a sign of rebellion to the generation before me. Was it wrong? No. Was it considerate? Yes, it was. And we need to think about those things. And we'll talk about why as we go along. Verses uh, 30, uh, the Sabbath day in worship and reverence for God. Verse 31, spiritus. Verse 32, respect for the elderly. Verse 33 and 34, kindness to strangers. Verse 35 and 36, integrity in business. And finally, in verse 37, therefore you shall observe my statutes and my commandments and my judgments and perform them. I am Yahweh. All of those sections I just mentioned end or begin with, I am Yahweh. So, what do we do with this? What's the Scripture saying? And I know where we are time-wise, so I'm going to be quick, and then you can chew on this. I I think part of what God's trying to do for them and ultimately for us, because remember, when God writes this down, He's not just thinking of them, He's thinking of us. We need to appreciate that God's identity is expressed in his holiness. Say that again. We need to appreciate that who God is, God's identity is expressed in his holiness. He starts the section, I am holy. Don't be like the Canaanites. Don't be like the Egyptians. Don't be like everybody else. Be like me. Verse 9, chapter 19, verse 2, You be holy, for I am holy. Well, what does that mean? Well, we, well, that means God's set apart, and we're supposed to have him different from everything else. Yes, but it's much more than that. God's holy, folks, because he's not us. God is self-existent. I'm not. God is independent, as much as I'd like to think I am. My air conditioner broke down, and I was screaming at the energy. Okay? I'm dependent upon them. I'm dependent upon the water people and the electric people, and I'm dependent upon the farmers, and I'm dependent on God for my very life. I'm dependent on doctors. I have friends who are completely dependent upon the pharmaceutical industry. They don't have to eat anymore because they take so many pills. We are dependent people, but God's not. God is not like the world. He's not bound by the things that bind us. He is separate and over. Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, Paul makes the argument to the people in Athens that God has determined the times and the boundaries of our habitation, but God's not bound like we are. You know why God fascinates us with the idea of prophecy? And there's some phenomenal prophecies in the Old Testament. Hundreds and maybe thousands of years before something happened, God specifies by name. I'll tell you why it, 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 it happens with God. Because God doesn't measure things by the sun going up and the sun going down. He is outside of the realm that we live in. And so when he looks at our history, it's all at the same time. If you, if there's no time. Do you catch that? So it's at the same time because there's no time. God can see it over here and see it over here because for us, you got to have the sun and the earth revolving. And, and the, but God doesn't see things that way. He can tell us this is what's going to happen in your life because I can already see it because I am not bound the way that you are bound. And his character is not determined by us. I, I hear people say this on a pretty regular basis. Well, God, God would want this. Now, there's a lot of ways you can blaspheme God. This may be the ultimate one. So can I suggest to you to be really careful about saying God would do this or God would do that? We are not God. And God is not us. He is not made in our image. We are made in his image. His thoughts are not our thoughts, Isaiah chapter 55 And as he says to Job, when Job says, look, I'd just like God to give me a chance to to have an interview because I want an explanation. You know what God's response to Job is? Where were you when I did all this stuff? Where were you when I created everything? In essence, what he says is, I'm God and you're not. And that's what we learn here. 
Why should I act this way? Why should I be this way? Why should I not give myself to idolatry? Why should I dress this way? Why should I conduct myself this way? Because this is who Yahweh is, and he ain't us. We are supposed to be him. Second observation I would make that grows out of that, and that is his authority is inherent in this identity. There is a sense in which chapters 18 and 19 are saying this. It's not this way in the language, it's not this way in the translations, but I, I do think it's inherent in it. Don't let your children to pass through the fire to Molech because I am God. You get this if you've raised kids or if you're old enough and your parents did this to you. I, y'all know my daughters. Y'all especially know Tori and Emily. Uh, they are independent-minded young women. And all their life, they excused anything they did. And they would just argue with you about why they were right in whatever they did. Raising them, hey, this was wrong. Well, but this is the reason I did this. No, it doesn't matter. Well, but Dad, here's my justification. And they would just argue with you all day long because they got all of those genes from their mama. (laughs) And you laugh about that. There's a lot more truth to that than you know. And you know what I'd do with them is I'd go ahead and argue with them for a while until I finally got my belly full and I would end up saying, do it because I said so. (laughs) You get that, don't you? Or maybe I should do it this way, the South Side folks. Because I said so. (laughs) You know, there's a sense in what God is in, 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 in this passage that that's what God's doing. That, that kind, of, kind of rubs against our grain, not only as human beings, but I think especially as Americans. But we need to understand something about the authority of God that's inherent in the fact that he is God. If he says so, that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be, and submission is inevitable. Right now, and we'll talk about this Thursday in my lesson, we have a choice about what we're going to do and whether we're going to serve God and trust God, but you're not always going to have that choice. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and everyone will give an account of himself to God. Romans chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. When Jesus says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, what he means is, I'm the ruler because I'm God. I'm the same being that was back here making these statements in Leviticus 18 and 19. And if I say it, that's the way it is. And you're going to understand that eventually you're going to bow to me and you're going to acknowledge my authority because I'm God and you are not. And my acceptance, my agreement, my opinions don't mean diddly squat compared to God. Do we get that? You can shake your head yes until you get to something you don't like. And that's the world we live in. That's exactly the point David was making yesterday about our relationship to the Word of God. We get to where we don't like the teaching or what the text says, suddenly we think of ourselves as having the right to say and do what we want to do. The only reason you have that right is because God granted it to you and he's going to take it away. So God's authority is expressed in his identity. And and folks, real faith, real trust has no right to question or to alter what God says. And then finally, what this passage is saying to us is that my identity is expressed in conforming to God's identity. That's why he gives them all these laws. Do this because I'm holy, because I'm God. And when you act this way, then you act the way that I act. And when you think this way, then you think the way that I think. And that's precisely what Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1. Be obedient children. You've been begotten of God. Be holy for I am holy. Peter takes this passage and uses it exactly the way that God is expressing it to the children of Israel. Do these things. Don't do these things. Here's what holiness is. Here's what it is, not only to be separate from the world, but to be separated to God. We're we're not just distinct from. We're distinct to. 
And that's where faith leads us and where obedience goes. It helps us to understand, as God tells them in chapter 18, don't be like the Canaanites, don't be like the Egyptians, do what I tell you to do, I am Yahweh. Or as Paul tells the Romans, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is reasonable service. Don't be just conformed. I mean, transform the world. Be conformed to God. We live in an age that, that has lost its bearings where subjective truth is, 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 is held out by our society as the end-all, be-all. Whatever you think is okay, whatever gender you choose is okay, however you want to identify yourself is okay. And, and, and God has granted us the right as people made in his image to have free moral character, and we can choose what we want to do. But, but please understand, Objective truth still exists. And you want to know how you define it? I am Yahweh. Thanks for your attention. You can stand at ease for a few moments.
we could come to our seats, please. I know that many of you follow Ken Welliver's blog. It's called The Preacher's Word. He does excellent writing. But his email address is Preacher Man, which I always thought kind of sounded like a superhero, doesn't it? But Brother Welliver, for his lectures this week, has prepared sermon sheets. Now these are on the podium in the foyer, so each time he has a lecture, those sheets will be available for you to follow along or might be good for you to give to your children uh, that they can uh, stay engaged as we go through the week. We want to make sure you're aware of the sermon sheets. Ken Welliver will speak this morning his second lecture on what has been the theme for his blog in 2023, Sowing Seeds for Spiritual Growth. What does the scripture say about spiritual growth? Brother Stevens is going to lead us in a song, and then we'll look forward to hearing from the preacher man. On May the 29th, 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary was the first man to scale Mount Everest, the highest mountain known to man, 29,000 feet up. He was knighted for his efforts, and in fact, uh, some of you remember back that far, a few of you maybe, they even made an American Express commercial with Sir Edmund Hillary. However, when you read his book, High Adventure, you realize there was much that went on behind the scenes and how Hillary had to grow into reaching that success. In fact, in 1952, he attempted to climb Mount Everest and failed. 
It's said that a few weeks later that a group in England asked him to address its members. And as they introduced Hillary, he walked to the stage with thunderous applause. And as he began his speech, he moved away from the microphone and looked back at the screen that had a picture of Mount Everest on it. And he shook his fist and he pointed at the screen and he said, Mount Everest, you have grown all that you will ever grow. You beat me the first time, but I will beat you the second time because I'm still growing. And with that, Hillary made the point that is simple and obvious to us that the challenge and the obstacle of this great mountain would remain the same. But he had the ability to improve and to learn and to get better and to get stronger and to get smarter and to use new techniques and to be able to grow, to be able to accomplish this feat. Growth, of course, is essential to success in life in any endeavor. It's true physically. It's true in the sports world. It's true in the business world. It's true emotionally, mentally, and it's certainly true spiritually. And so as Bubba announced, our lesson this morning is sowing seeds for spiritual growth. Well, Russ, Bubba's on a roll. He said nice, thing, nice things about me too. So I think there's been repentance involved in his life. And so that's good, Bubba. Thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate your mention about the sermon sheets. That's just something that I do. Uh, I know it ties me down a little bit. Sometimes I wish I didn't have it there because someone will come up, especially a melancholy, and say, I, I missed a blank. You didn't have that on the screen. And they want to get the blank filled in. And I always think, boy, I hope they got the point of the lesson and not just worried about the blank. But uh, hopefully that's helpful to you to follow along in something that you can take home with you. I thank again the shepherds for the confidence they placed in me to come and to be here. And uh, I feel like as the oldest person on this lectureship that I got, I'm glad I had these young men carrying the load here for me. And so that, that's good. I appreciate that so very much. And I guess I'm the only non-Texas preacher. Um, although Jordan was born in Indiana just like I was, but uh, I think uh, Roger quipped that we were the token Yankees on the program. But uh, I appreciate that. If I'm a token or not, I appreciate being here and appreciate the opportunity to be able to share in these lessons. Well, <clears throat> as we think about this idea of sowing seeds for spiritual growth, and Bubba mentioned this. This has been my preaching and writing theme this year. And so I look back, I've got 27 posts on my blog and so for those of you that, that read my blog, or if you don't, if you just go to thepreachersword.com and go over to the category section and scroll down, i got a whole section there, and you can click that, and all the 27 will come up, and you can, you can read them. And so <clears throat> I sort of made the mistake of picking out this topic way back in January and thinking, well, I'm going to write and preach on this a lot. I have plenty of material, and I do. I have too much material. I got 27 posts, and I've worked up about 10 sermons now. And so I thought, what in the world am I going to do here for 40 to 45 minutes? And I got my inspiration from Bubba. I thought, here's the answer. Instead of 27 points, I'm going to boil it down to three points, Bubba. I want to be more like Bubba. Three points. Three points, ladies and gentlemen. I do have a few sub-points, though. The three points in the lesson is yours. The text is found in Galatians chapter 6 where Paul said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that we also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so there are three things here, by the way, that you can get out of this text. Number one, you reap what you sow. If you plant corn, you're going to get corn. If you plant beans, you're going to get beans. We all understand that in the physical realm. You reap what you sow. But secondly, you reap more than you sow. You put a grain of corn in the ground and an ear comes up and it's got hundreds and hundreds of grain on, on one ear. And maybe some stalks have a couple ears. So you reap more than you sow, but you reap later than you sow. 
You sow in the spring and you harvest in the fall. That's true in the physical realm. That's true in agriculture. That's true spiritually. And so when we think this morning about sowing seeds for spiritual growth, remember that you're going to reap what you sow. If you're not sowing to the Spirit, you're not going to reap of the Spirit. If you're not listening to things that were talked about in the, in the earlier lecture by Russ and understanding who God is and your relationship to him and you get out here and you want to sow what the Canaanites give you and sow their seed or the Egyptian seed, that's what you're going to reap. You're going to reap what you sow. And so it's important for us to understand that. So I want us to think about the three fundamentals that will help us in sowing the seeds for spiritual growth. And the first of these is the fact that we choose growth. You make a decision, you choose it. I, I grew up on a small farm in central Indiana, just uh, west of Indianapolis, and we had a few cows and, and pigs, and we had some field corn we grew for the animals, but we always had a garden. I mean, we had a big garden, not just a little patch like they had in the city. We had over at least an acre of garden every year, and sometimes more than that. And we grew beans and sweet corn and tomatoes and lettuce and cabbage and potatoes and peas and peppers and carrots and cucumbers and squash and radishes and turnips and beets and onions and eggplant and watermelons and cantaloupes and strawberries and maybe some things I can't remember. You say, why in the world did you grow all that stuff? Because my dad chose that. <laughs> he chose to have a big garden. <laughs> And he chose to plant those things because that's what he liked. And we got the seed, and I started to say, I chose to plant. He chose me to go out and help the plant, but it was his choice. And so when you choose, you make a choice, then you can get the job done. And that's true spiritually as well. Sometimes this point, though very simple, may elude us a little bit. And that we think that growth is just going to happen automatically. That's not true. The most basic principle of growth in any area, and especially spiritually, comes with choice. The leadership guru, John Maxwell, calls this the law of intentionality. That growth does not just happen, it is a choice that we make. There's a 19th century writer, and as far as I've been able to determine, there's only one little book he wrote, and it's entitled, As a Man Thinketh. And you can find him in Hallmark gift shops, and it's a neat little book. But in the book, James A. Allen said this, People are anxious to improve their circumstances, but they're unwilling to improve themselves. Therefore, they remain bound. And that's true. And I, I, I hear people sometimes spiritually say, Preacher, I want to do better. I, I want to be a better Christian. I want to know the Bible more. And, and I want to develop this, this skill or that skill. Or, or I want to be a teacher. I like getting involved in evangelism. And they may have a desire to improve their spiritual circumstances, but they're unwilling to improve themselves. And so they don't grow. They may remain bound where they are. Growth is a fundamental concept of Christianity. Jesus wants us to grow. Now, but he doesn't force us to grow. He gives us a choice to believe him and to follow him or not. And so it's our decision. This has always been true, and Russ certainly alluded to this in talking about the children of Israel. There are times they chose to listen to Yahweh. There are times they chose to reject Yahweh, but it was always their choice. He didn't force them, and he doesn't force us today. But God wants us to grow spiritually. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 21, it says that him, the whole building being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And so we have this metaphor, the idea of an edifice or a building and, and laying the foundation and it growing. And, and you and I, as lively stones that comprise, compose that building, are a part of that growth. Or we could turn over to chapter 4 in Ephesians, where he said that we're to no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But... 
speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into, an, into him who is the head, Christ. Grow up. God says, grow up. And then one more passage along the sign, 2 Peter 3, 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, if we've got any English teachers in the room this morning, you can look at that and say, well, the way the word grow is used there is a verb, but what's the subject? Well, it's understood. It's the understood subject. You, that's the command. You know, that's a direct command. I don't know if that's being talked about any in this lectureship or not, but, you know, we talk about how to establish authority. And we've talked for years about direct commands and approved examples of necessary inferences. And we marvel at some of our religious friends that can't understand a direct command to repent and be baptized. And yet, in this a direct command, you grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've got a couple blog posts on growing in grace. You wonder what it means to grow in grace? Go to the preacher's word and you read a whole blog on that. We don't have time to talk about it this morning. Growing in knowledge, maybe we have a little bit more of an idea about that. George Eliot said, the strongest principle of growth lies in human choice. And that's right. We have a choice. And then one of my favorite writers that I've read from through the years, Anonymous, said this, when growth stops, decay begins. And that's right. You've got to keep on growing. You know, Kali, when I was a student at Florida College, and I do use that term somewhat loosely, not Florida College student, okay? Uh, I took every class I could get under Brother Haley, the prophets and revelation and, you know, scheme of redemption and all of that. And I thought he was a really old man when I was there back in the 60s. That's 1960s, by the way, okay? And, uh, but actually, he, he was then about 10 years younger than I am now at that time. But, and as preacher boys, so sometimes get carried away and introduce him, Brother Haley, as a scholar, you know, if we had to introduce him as some function or something. And he had always remind us in chat, he said, now, boys, he said, I'm still a student. I'm still learning, just like you are. I'm still learning. And he could get up there and, and uh, put scriptures on a blackboard Y'all know what a blackboard is? Okay. I'm really dating myself with some of these things here. But he'd just write the reference on the blackboard, never crack his Bible. Some of you have seen that and quote every single one of them. And I thought, he's still a student? You know, if Homer Haley could have said that at age 65 or so, I'm still a student, what about me? What about you? Are you still a student? Are you still growing? Well, the challenge is, why don't some Christians grow? Well, one reason is the assumption gap. John Maxwell has a book about growth, and he applies it to the business world and leadership and such things as that. And he has a whole bunch of things there why people don't grow in that area. And I thought two or three of them were certainly applicable spiritually, and these three come from that book. But he says there's an assumption gap that sometimes people think growth is automatic. And we look at children, and they seem to grow automatically just by getting older. Of course, that's not really true, but it almost seems that way. Well, you can't just obey the gospel, come up out of the baptistry, and start growing spiritually. It, it, you don't assume that, that it takes work and it takes effort. And then there's a knowledge gap. And there are people that, that, that I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. How, how can I grow? How can I learn? Well, in the business world, there's success seminars to teach you. And there's books and there's recordings and, and there's mentors. and There's all kinds of things. In the sports world, there's all kinds of ways that you can improve yourself. When our son Kenny was a, a teenager and he was wanting to play basketball, I'd send him to camps. And uh, I'd send him to Louisville to their camp. And, of course, I sent him to the best camp in the United States, the Indiana University basketball camp. But um, different places I'd send him to camps because he could learn. He could, he could develop skills and he could improve himself and gain knowledge about the game of basketball. Well, God has provided us in his word a way that we might grow and have the knowledge. And so Peter would put it this way, his divine power has given to us all things. 
that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. Now, that's a, that's a powerful passage when you think about it. He's given us all things. I mean, here in the 21st century, with the modern problems that we face and the modern challenges and issues and decisions that we have to deal with, we have in this old book all things. Isn't that something when you think about these issues? Gender identity. The Bible tells you the answer to that, you see. Sexual relations that Russ talked about earlier, both from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. We have information on that. I mean, you just think about everything from your personal life and morals and ethics and marriage and success and business and getting along with other people. I mean, you, you try to think of something that really has to do with life and how to live life that the Bible doesn't tell us about. And then the third problem or gap is the timing gap. It's not the right time. You know, preacher, I'm, I'm going to get more involved in the Lord's work and I'm, I'm going to grow and I'm going to do these things you're talking about. But boy, I'm just so busy right now. And I've just got so much going on in my family and, and my business is growing right now. And the time, the time is just not right. There's an old riddle that you probably have heard. Five frogs were sitting on a log and four decided to jump. How many are left? Now, you know the answer to that, don't you? If you said one, you're wrong. Because the four that decided to jump never jumped. They decided to, but they still sat there. They, they didn't do it. The word of the Bible is today. Three times in Hebrews 3, he talks about today, today, today. If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And so that's the first principle, that if you want to grow spiritually and become a bigger Christian, a better Christian, and a more spiritual person, you've got to decide. You have to choose growth. The second principle is this. You must embrace change. Now, that's a tough one. The, the late author Howard Hendricks and a longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary once wrote that people go through three stages when faced with change. He said stage one is resistance to change, and stage two is tolerance to change, and then stage three is to embrace change. And then he says this, as an observer of the human condition, it seems that most people remain in stage one. Some are able to accept stage two, and fewer yet actually move to stage two. Three, well, we must learn to embrace change. There's a Greek philosopher that I think lived maybe four or 500 years before Christ, but I'm saying his name right, Herculitis, and he said this, change is the only constant in life. <laughs> oh my, I wonder if Herculitis was alive today, what he would think. But change is a constant in life. How much change have you seen in your life? physically, in your family, in our country. I mean, it's pretty incredible, I'd say, just in the last two decades, the amount of change we have seen in our country. There's a lot of change. Some of it's good, a lot of it is not good. But change is just a part of life. Well, the Christian life involves change. Christian growth involves change. And I want to just bullet a few things here for you to illustrate how that Christian growth involves change. And some of it we, we understand in the very beginning. For instance, when you become a Christian, there is a change in relationship. And we certainly ought to understand that. In Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about those that have been baptized into Christ and how they put on Christ. And how he goes on in chapter and talks about that they were servants of sin and now you become a servant of righteousness. And so there is a change in relationship. You went from serving Satan and serving the devil and now you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's much, of course, as you know, in the New Testament that talks about our relationship to the Lord. And so growth involves a change in our relationship. But then it should involve a change in our thinking, in our attitudes. Just as children grow up and hopefully learn to put away childish thinking, so Christians are to grow in this area. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul even specifically used that analogy in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, I've known a few uh, folks over the years that I'd like to just say to them, you know, get rid of your childish ways, your childish thinking and your childish talk and your childish attitudes and actions. Grow up. We need to grow in our attitudes. And when we grow in our attitudes, Philippians 2, 5, Paul said, we develop the mind of Christ. Some versions translate that the attitude of Christ. And so Christian growth involves a change in relationship, a change in attitudes, and then a change in behavior. I'm not going to read this text, but if you want to turn to it and just peruse it as I briefly go through it, Ephesians chapter 4, and you beginning of verse 17, my Bible has a heading, yours may have this, it says the new man. And so you just put your finger down there and you begin to read that we're not the walkers of the Gentiles and that we're not to have our understanding darkened, and we're not to be alienated from the truth, and, and we're not to live in lust and lewdness as they lived, and we didn't learn Christ that way. And you read on that, we're to put off the former behavior, the former conduct, the old man that's corrupt, and we're to put on the new man and a new behavior, and we're to put away lying, and we're to speak the truth, and, and our anger not to give in to sin, and not to give place to the devil, and not to steal, to be honest, and everything and not to allow corrupt words to come out of our mouth but only that which will edify and build people up and to be kind and, and considerate and forgiving of one another and to put away things like bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and then you go into chapter 5 and he keeps going there and he talks about how we're to walk in love and we're not to be greedy and that we need to be careful not to give in to, to filthiness or foolish kinds of talking. And on he goes there talking about walking as children of light and walking in wisdom and redeeming the time. I mean, this is just such a great text. And you think about all of this speaks to a change. It's a change in behavior. And if we're going to grow, we must embrace this change in behavior to put off the things we need to be getting rid of and to put on the things that the Lord says that we need to put on. They're created in righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the idea of the change of faith. Now, that may sound initially a little bit strange to us. You say, well, wait a minute, faith is faith. Well, no, faith should not stay static. Faith grows. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, the apostle said to the Thessalonians, your faith groweth exceedingly. The ESV translates that, your faith is growing abundantly. The New American Standard Update renders it, your faith is greatly enlarged. The NIV simply says, your faith is growing more and more. And so this verse reminds us that faith is not a static thing. It can increase, it can develop, it can mature, it can become bigger and better and greater. A well-grounded faith grows organically like a tree. And so there is that fundamental faith that leads us to say, I believe in God, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and I believe that I'm lost and I need to obey the gospel to be saved. And that's a very fundamental faith that leads us to become a Christian. But we don't stop there. We continue. Our faith grows exceedingly. And Christian growth involves this growth and change in faith. And then there's a change in knowledge and in understanding. The Hebrew Christians, and we'll come to this verse a little later in the study here, were rebuked because that they hadn't grown in knowledge. And there was a time, he said in Hebrews 5, 12, he said, you've been Christians long enough, you know, that you ought to be teaching other folks, but you need to be taught again, that you haven't grown like you need to grow. And they hadn't gotten into the Word like they had. And so the thing, and it's the theme of this whole lectureship, as we think about what the Scriptures are, say to us, that we need to get into the Scriptures and I think it's so neat the way each one of the speakers have come up with different areas that are, that are so pertinent and practical and helpful. And all this helps us grow if we will take it in 
and apply it to our lives. But you've got to have the right kind of seed. Going back to our text in Galatians 6, that you're going to reap what you sow. And so are we sowing the Word. Are we putting what the Scripture says into our hearts? I read a uh, little piece, sometimes going to read this digest, about a company that had sent out a promotional piece of advertising and they sent these little business postcards and it had a mustard seed they said glued to it and the caption went something like this. If you have faith as small as this mustard seed, and I won't mention the product, in our product, you are guaranteed to get excellent results and be totally satisfied. Sign the management. A few months later, one of the recipients of this promotional piece wrote the company back and said this, you will be very interested to know that I planted the mustard seed that you sent on your advertising card and it has grown into a very healthy bush producing wonderful tomatoes. Well, this, this reminds us that you're going to reap what you sow, but you better sow the right kind of seed or that you might end up reaping something else. And so we need to grow in our knowledge and in our understanding. Author and lecturer Gail Sheehy once said, if we don't change, we don't grow. And if we don't grow, we're not really living. Jesus came and said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. An abundant life in him is a life of growth. And then number three, growth, you should expect challenges. That's just, uh, that's just a part of life, isn't it, in any area we grow. Going back to my days on the uh, farm in Indiana, I can remember conversations, and, and we, we were small potatoes. We didn't farm for a living. But all around us were large farms, and these guys farmed for a living. And I can recall conversations that my dad would have with some of the farmers, and almost every year there was some challenge uh, or challenges the farmers had to face. Some years there was too much rain in the spring and that delayed the planting of the crops, which um, was not ideal. And then other years there might, might have been drought or there was a problem of bugs and insects. And of course, there's always a problem with weeds. In addition to the elements of nature, there was a price of grain and fertilizer and pesticide and insecticide. And, and then the, all of this, it added up to the increase of production cost. Then there was the unseen fluctuations in, in markets and uh, economic conditions and all of that sort of thing. And so today's farmers, they deal not only with all of that, but even more because they're dealing with more government uh, regulations, some would say interference, supply chain issues, energy costs, trade agreements with other countries. Think about what it takes to be a farmer. Thank God for the farmers. And yet, the farmers that I've known through the years, they love it, and they accept the challenges gladly. Many feel, as did our first president, George Washington, who once said, I'd rather be on my farm than be emperor of the world. Well, farming is important but you got to meet the challenges. And in the Christian life, if we're going to grow, we have got to meet the challenges. You see, not everyone is going to cooperate with our spiritual goals. And not everything is going to go just exactly like we think it ought to go. See, the devil doesn't want you to grow. I guess you all knew that, probably. The, the, devil, the devil doesn't want you to grow. The devil's out to get you. I mean, Jesus predicted this with Peter's denial when he offered this warning, and he said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. And like the chaff separate from the grain, Satan seeks to separate us from Jesus Christ today. The devil will find your weakness, and he will attack your weakness. He may tempt you with the pleasures of this world. He may tempt you with the pride of life. He may tempt you with the lure of possessions or the lust of the flesh or the inordinate desire for money. Satan doesn't want you to grow spiritually. Satan doesn't want you to grow closer to God. He doesn't want you developing your spiritual gifts and talents and engaging in ministry. He doesn't want you to develop deeper commitment and greater growth. 
because he knows if you do all of that, you're less likely to fall away. He's not going to get you. But if we grow in the way that we should grow, then it's not as likely he's going to get us. You know, in all those things I mentioned, if the devil can't get us in any of those, he may use the form of family that fail to accept our priorities. Or it may be friends that turn their back on us because we're Christians. Or it may be co-workers that ridicule our faith. And young people, it may be some of your schoolmates. It could even be, sadly, your teachers. And we're, we're living in crazy times today where some of the things that are being promoted and pushed in our educational systems are so contrary to the Word of God, blasphemous against the very nature. And sometimes students that stand up, I read of a student the other day that got expelled from school because he wore a T-shirt and said God made two genders. And they expelled him from school for wearing that T-shirt. There's challenges but you're going to have to accept the challenges and meet the challenges. Jesus himself said a person's enemies will be those of his own household. The devil doesn't want you to grow. And the problems that come up, whatever the problems may be, they may be fiscal, they may be financial, they may be relational, they may be problems sometimes that even come up in the church with God's people. Job said, man that is born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. We got problems and we have challenges that we need to overcome those and realize they're a part of life. You see, growth doesn't mean life gets easier. In fact, the challenges get, get bigger, but the rewards become greater. Eating meat is harder than drinking milk. And so this challenge I leave you with from Scripture, from e Hebrews chapter 5, for Paul rebuked those that had not grown. He said, for by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need someone teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone that lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those that have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, to grow, to become what God would have you to be. Three fundamentals of growth. There's a lot of other things involved in growth, but those are three that I think are fundamental. Before we sing the song, and there very well could be one here this morning that owes a duty to God, it could be someone here that's never obeyed the gospel through faith, repentance, and baptism, and this would be the day that you choose to become a child of God and begin this path that we've addressed ourselves to today. Or maybe someone has something heavy on their heart and you desire the prayers of your church family. I think I know these shepherds and Bubba and the people here well enough know they will embrace you and they will lift you in prayer before the throne of God. I want to close before we sing, though, Tim, with this little story. It's baseball season. It is a great story uh, that is told and told for the truth. It could be another one of these legends that Ralph Walker accuses me of propagating on my blog. But some of the old timers remember Dizzy Dean. I, I remember him as a little kid. He had already retired from baseball, and he was an announcer on the game of the week. And the game of the week was always the Yankees and whoever they played. And he had Dizzy Dean on there. But Dizzy Dean was a member of the so-called Gas House Gang with the St. Louis Cardinals. In 1934, Dizzy had a 30-7 and seven record as a pitcher. He led the league in strikeouts. He led the league in shutouts. He won two games in the World Series, including the seventh game against the Detroit Tigers. He was named the most valuable player in 1934. The following spring in 1935, when the rookies, you know, come to camp early, there was a reporter for the St. Louis Dispatch that went out to check out their young talent. And lo and behold, who did he see out there but Dizzy Dean? And he walked up to him and he said, Diz, 
what in the world are you doing? You don't have to report for maybe it was a couple weeks later. He said, you don't have to be here already. What are you doing out here with these rookies, the kind of year you had, an all-star, a most valuable player? What are you doing here? And supposedly, Dizzy Dean looked the reporter and replied. He said, partner, when you quit getting better, you quit being good. Now, there's a great spiritual application there for us, ladies and gentlemen. When we quit getting better, we run the risk of not being good. Are you getting better? Are you using this lecture shift to grow and develop and to become everything God would have you to be? I hope no matter where you are in your spiritual journey or how mature you are, how much you know, or what you've attained, you'll keep getting better. May God bless us that end. Tim will stand and sing the song. having the lectures we just don't do it because it's tradition or it's just another year we're interested in spiritual growth that comes from the scriptures and your interest this morning is to be commended we're going to have a final song and then uh, Daryl Trammell is visiting this week with his wife and his son they're part of the work in Burnett, Texas. And I'm going to ask Daryl to lead our dismissal prayer. And tonight we'll meet again at 7 for 30 minutes of singing. And then we'll hear from Jordan Schaus and from David Banning, who's just been sitting there quietly since he opened the lectures yesterday morning. And we'll hear two more wonderful sermons about what says the scripture. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for being with us today. Do all in the name of the Lord. One verse, please. Do what Glorious God in heaven, we're so thankful that you've revealed yourself to us through your word. We're thankful for these men who have spent their time to put together a lesson that will be so greatly beneficial to us all. We've truly been blessed to be here today. We're so thankful for the congregation of your people that are here, their efforts to share the gospel and share the word that we might all know you and we might all grow in our grace and our knowledge of you. We pray, Father, that 
as this lectureship continues, that you will continue to bless us with these opportunities. And as we separate this time, looking forward to an opportunity to be back together, we ask that you keep us safe. But most of all, Lord, we ask that you help us to be strong and that we might be the salt of the earth, the light into the world that we should be, that we might always have an influence for good around us, and that you might be pleased with our efforts on your behalf. We thank you, Father, for your son. We thank you for his love and his willingness to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We pray that we might keep this in the forefront of our minds, that we might realize the terrible cost of sin, but also the great gift of grace. We ask that you continue to bless us, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.